The Michelin name is synonymous with quality around the world, yet many who appreciate the performance of numerous Michelin products are unaware that the company's first tire product was a bicycle tire in 1891 when the Michelin brothers patented the first detachable bicycle bead tire. To this day, Michelin continues to innovate and produce world-class products for road bicycles, mountain bikes, and specifically designed products for e-mountain bikes like the Michelin E-Wild Tire it's the tire choice for my team, the Impact Results EMTB team that's competing in the 2021 EMTB GNCC National Championship. This partnership will enable the team and its riders to showcase the performance, versatility, and durability of the Michelin E Wild Tires during our efforts to defend and pursue even more championships. Also for 2021, Michelin is introducing many exciting new products like the Michelin Force AM2 tire and the Michelin Wild AM2 tire designed for a variety of mountain bike terrains as well as, this one I'm excited about, the Michelin Pilot SX and the Michelin Pilot SX slick tire specifically for world-class level BMX racers like Connor Fields, even Darkside, or myself. <laughs> Follow at Michelin Bicycle on Instagram or learn more about their extensive range of bicycle products by checking out their website or obviously engaging with them on social. Again, it's at Michelin Bicycle on Instagram. Welcome, Welcome to the Moto Marketing Podcast, presented by Racer X, the podcast for moto industry professionals, entrepreneurs, and riders. If you want to grow your brand and business in today's digital first world, you have to know how to turn a stranger into a fan, turn a like into a customer. You have to know how to turn attention into dollars. This podcast is dedicated to keeping you in the know on real marketing tactics that work in the moto world so that you grow your business and help grow the sport. Get ready to learn from the very same marketing experts trusted by Racer X, Lucas Oil Pro Motocross, GNCC, and NBC Sports. They'll help you navigate the world of digital marketing for your moto brand. This is the Moto Marketing Podcast. Podcast. Presented by Racer X. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Moto Marketing Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Nestler. We've got an exciting guest for you today. Before we dive into it, I want to tell you about Racer X's latest promotion. If you're watching us on YouTube, you can see me holding up this rad sticker sheet. Now until May 6th, if you subscribe or renew, um, you're going to get this limited edition uh, Racer X sticker sheet. So whether it's for you or your, your little ripper at the house, um, it's something cool. I would have loved this when I was a kid. You can subscribe. Uh, our guest has a link today. Uh, racerxonline.com forward slash Blair or you can use my link because I'm such a nice guy I'm promoting Daniel's link as well you can use my link as well as racerxonline.com forward slash moto marketing uh, and that is good until May 6th all right, we've got, uh, we're pressed for time today because our guest is quickly becoming known as one of the busiest mans in moto. Um, we've got Daniel Blair with us today. Daniel, I appreciate you coming on. You're literally sitting in the parking lot of the stadium before you get ready for tonight's Supercross race. So <laughs> there it is. Hey, welcome to the yeah. show, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I know we've been wanting to do this for a long time and, uh, the timing, it, it works for me. Again, I, I, it is race day. I have to lock in here and get my mind focused on my job at hand today. But a little morning communication doesn't hurt. It kind of gets your brain firing. And I thought it'd be a good time to talk about some Eagle Grit stuff. I, As surprising this may seem to many, I, it, it is race day. But I was up at 6 this morning just processing orders, getting things ready for uh, some deliveries that my wife is making today. So I've been up and at it. And I thought, you know what, let's just let's let's talk a little Eagle Grit. And, I'll, you know, I've tell you a little bit about what's going on and, and kind of maybe I guess the vision and what I have for the company and yeah why not do it while I'm here in the parking lot kind of get the vocals warmed up for the night yeah, and uh, get that brain get that brain fire <laughs> so diving into it I mean you've got 
<clears throat> there's so much to your story from, you know, professional athlete to now you're, you're becoming known as one of the faces of, uh, of Supercross and in your role with kind of your on air, um, you know, content that you're creating and, you know, your after the race stuff with Blair's breakdown, you've got all this stuff that you're doing. You've got your podcast that you produce, but then somehow you, you've got this, this company that really is your, your day job. When, when did you get that entrepreneurial bug? Like, was it something that you started this right after you were done racing? Like, when did Eagle Grit kind of come into the fold? Because we all have seen you on TV, so we have an idea of when that started. But as far as you actually, you know, diving into this business venture, um, how long has this been going on? Man, it all kind of sort of kind of happened at the same time. I mean, if I if I go back to the origin of all this, I, you know, this is like probably 2012 or 2013. I kind of had a, I mean, if I'm being honest, I had a little bit of an emotional breakdown. I didn't know what I was doing with my life. I was still racing, but not really competitive. I had a lot of injuries that were kind of holding me back from even pursuing things at a, at a real level. Plus, I mean, I'm at that point, I'm 30 years old. So it was like this realization that the next chapter had to start. And I was extremely emotional. I mean, I had a, I just had a kid. I had a second kid on the way. I'm this, it was just kind of piling up. And I, I just, I knew I had to do something outside of racing because dirt bike racing isn't going to last forever. And the amount of money I was making with racing was definitely helping me survive, but it wasn't getting me anywhere. It wasn't moving my life forward. So um, I just, I, God, I put my head down and said, all right, you're going to, I'm, I'm going to, come out of this little breakdown, uh, emotional breakdown that I was having and just, I was going to hit it wide open and just hit it as absolute hard as I could. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the movie. Yes, man with Jim Carrey, but I kind of turned into that guy where I was just, yes. Yeah. I'll, yeah. Okay. I'll do that. I'll do this. I'll do that. And I got my class a license. I worked for a trucking company for a while. I worked for a construction company as a superintendent for a while, which was insane. Cause I didn't know what I was doing, but <laughs> pulled off some weird stuff in that time. Um, yeah, I, I started a cab business with my buddy, Hobo Nick. Um, it was called charity cab. So we were, you know, a cab business with a bunch of Toyota Priuses and we were giving people rides to the airports. We were donating a dollar of every third of charity, local charities and, um, tried that kind of didn't work all the way. I, I went into business with my dad for a little bit. That didn't really work out. I just, I, I kind of just hit every angle of anything that sounded like it could be something. Um, and then it all kind of started happening at the same time that the, the TV opportunity hit. Um, I, 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 I hit that as hard as I could, as you guys all probably seen. Um, I, a good buddy of mine uh, had an idea to start a, a hand soap business, which I was like, at first I thought was silly. Uh, but he convinced me that there was something there. And I, man, I just, I, again, back to the yes, man, I said, okay, let's do it. So all these things kind of happen at the exact same time. And I just, I realized that if I was awake, I needed to be pushing and, and, and chasing something, you know, I just mainly cause I had a responsibility to my, my kids and my wife. And I, I don't know, I just, I was, I, I had hit rock bottom. And I think the only way to bounce back was to hit it as hard as possible, which I'm still doing today. And it's all finally paying off. The, the TV career is like, it's, I'm super happy. Um, the business is now four years in, it's exploding on my lap, which is a good and bad thing kind of, but, um, just, yeah, it, it came down to more of a, of an, of an emotional bounce back than any kind of entrepreneurial, you know, you know, drive It just, this is just how it landed because I was just going for it. Yeah. So, uh, again, I, I'm, I'm now in a difficult, but really good place, um, after a good seven or eight years of, of some, of some heavy suffering, but. I mean, I got to be honest, it's all worth it, everything I went through. So, what for, for, well, first off, for those that m might not be super familiar uh, with Eagle Grit and, and your lineup of products, walk us through what that is so that we can kind of set that stage. Yeah, it's I'm, predominantly we're a hand cleaner business. That's our, that's our, our main item. Uh, we have, we have a really high quality hand cleaner um, that's in a pretty good price point because there's some other ones out there that are pretty dang expensive and, then of course you got, you know, you got the cheaper ones on the market that everybody kind of knows. I don't want to say names cause I'm not, I'm not like that. I don't want to disrespect the competition, but we found a nice little, uh, a nice little spot where we have a super high quality hand cleaner. Um, we, we developed the product to kind of, <laughs> I guess, alleviate people from the, the bad things about other products. You know, there's no solvents in our product. There's, 
no pumice, which is like a lava rock that kind of shreds your hands. So we just created a product that was really high quality that leaves your hands feeling really good afterwards. And, you know, we, we developed it not for the moto industry as much as for the world that, you know, auto mechanics and steel manufacturing plants and city and state governments, they, they all use, everybody uses a hand cleaner in, in the business world. And we wanted to create something that really, you know, crossed over into everything. Yeah. So that was our, our that's our, our dominant item. That's, that's the tip of the sword, as I would call it. We have hand wipes, which have turned into a freaking monster for us. It was, you know, it was meant to be a complimentary item to our hand cleaner, but those have skyrocketed out of control um, that people are loving these hand wipes that are, you can take to the track or you could whatever. I mean, they're, they're multi-purpose. Um, and then we just started developing items that complemented our catalog and, you know, glass cleaners and brake cleaner and degreasers and all purpose cleaner, bike wash, and just, you know, all these items that just kind of complement the catalog. They're, they're not really our focus. They're more like, Hey, we have this stuff and it works great too. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, we, we are a hand cleaner business and um, it's, it, it's taken off, man. It's, it's unfortunately with, with COVID, um, unfortunately for the world, this is a tough time, but for business, it's, it's a good time to be in the hand cleaner business. I was so, going to say, yeah, for what you're doing, yeah, did you see a, did, did you see a correlation there with a lift in business? Cause everybody was trying to get their hands as clean as possible for the last year. Did that transition into success with you guys too? Big time. I mean, big time. And again, it's one of those things that's, it's like, for me, honestly, I have a big heart. So I feel guilty in a way because like the world's going through this tough time. And we're all, you know, fighting through this together. And then here I am on the business side, kind of benefiting off this because I have a product that benefits people. And so I, I'm, in one sense, I'm super grateful that we can have an impact on people's lives by providing a good product that's really in need right now. But at the same time, I just have a little bit of guilt because it, it took a pandemic for us to really kind of explode. And I'm, again, it, it's a hard balance for me because I'm grateful, but also a little just, just, I just, just sad for the world and what it's going through in so many ways. But um, yeah, back to the company, we, we have, we have a great product that, um, that is in high need right now. And um, we, it's not an antibacterial. So we don't have some kind of special hospital grade product. It's just, it's a heavy duty industrial hand cleaner. That's for, for people that get really dirty. And um, it, you know, so it's not, it's not made for COVID, but I think with people now being way more conscious of their, of their health and their, their cleanliness, I mean, God, we just, we really, we really fit with what the world needs right now in a lot of ways. Walk me through, uh, I mean, it, you know, anybody that listens to this show probably listens to Paul and in, in, in your show, just Moto fans. So, you know, th- recently on one of uh, Steve's shows, everybody was kind of sitting around. I think it was when you guys were in Houston and joking about how, like, you're, you're doing everything. Like, you're selling popcorn and you're doing stand-ups and you're doing post-race shows and all this stuff. You're also running this freaking business. Uh, and you and I, you know, have had some conversations in the past week. And, you know, one of them was on the first break in the series. And and it was a break that you needed. But it wasn't like you got to go home and relax. You're, you're up early, even for East Coast time. And you're on the West Coast, you know, running routes and, 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 and working your business. Kind of give everybody a little insight on what that looks like when they don't see you on TV you know, you just said you're up in the hotel room working on processing orders. What does that look like as far as trying to balance all that right now? Man, um, <laughs> it's – if you think I'm working hard at Supercross, this is nothing compared to what I'm going through at home uh, or here with the things going on at home. Um, the, the timing of this probably wasn't the best, but it, it is what it is. But um, I was in a partnership. Um, and I ended up purchasing the other half of the partnership from my partner and it all landed on December 31st. I mean, if this would have happened in the summertime, like no problem at all, I, I could have definitely juggled this better. But the problem is, is that the company is exploding at the very, at the very time that my responsibilities have gone through the roof. Um, you know, I, I, I handle all of our outside sales. I handle a lot of our inside sales. My wife is doing her absolute best to keep up, but my kids are home on zoom. They haven't gone to school yet this year. So she's pretty buried with them. And, um, yeah, I I just, I I run everything. I mean, I run all the accounting. I, I run every aspect of the business, you know, accounts receivable, accounts, payable, inventory ordering. Um, I do all the outside sales, which is a minimum of 12 hours a day for me right now when I'm home. Uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm tapped. I, yeah. I am actually absolutely the worst I've ever been as far as the load on me. 
But at the same time, I'm so pumped because everything is going well and I'm, and I'm, I'm passionate about it. And I believe in what I'm doing so much that I go to bed every night, just like blacked out, tired, but smiling because it's working. And, and it's like the, for the first time in my life, like things are, things are really, really working out. It's not just a hope. It's, it's actually, it's manifesting into a reality. So it's tough, man. It's full time. Like I said, this morning, I was up processing orders, emailing, you know, a, a list of duties for my wife who luckily my kids are on spring break. So she can do a little bit more this week while I'm here in Texas. Um, but we're growing in every single way. Obviously online is growing like crazy. Um, but our, our home accounts, just the direct businesses that we work with and supply all these supplies, supply all the supplies too. That's growing. Our distribution is growing through, through a lot of uh, pretty, pretty big uh, outlets and uh, it's just chasing my tail right now wide open but I guess when you're motivated and you're driven and you see the light at the end of the tunnel which is yeah. I think the most important thing is I see I see the destination now for the yeah. first time you know that where I want to be uh, it's not it's not in the fog anymore I'm not blind to it I actually see this thing working it's so motivating that it gives me the, it gives me that extra 10 percent battery that I need right now and once May hits and things settle down here and I'm not traveling and I don't have to focus on Supercross and just the responsibilities here, I'm going to be fine. But at the same time, this is, this is, this is brutal. And I think the point you're trying to make is I was telling people on Pulp, like, don't buy, like, don't buy anything right now. Cause every time I go on Steve's show, I get, a, I get so many orders the next day and I was telling people just look out for your boy here, man. I'm having a hard time <laughs> yeah. here. Like we're put a reminder in your calendar to buy in, in, in August. <laughs> May, yeah, May 15th, let it rip. But you guys do my wife a favor because she barely still loves me. And you guys are going to, you guys are going to ruin my marriage if you guys keep ordering. So That's I told everyone to slow down a little bit, but <laughs> it's, uh, the, the, the responsibilities at home, Luke, they're, they're, it's heavy, man. It's yeah. pretty heavy. Hey, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, I want to talk to Daniel a little bit about his take on uh, the sport and then also what he's done a really good job of as, as far as building his personal brand and how he sees that kind of stemming into um, the growth of the business. So we'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. Fly Racing's 2021 line has been improved and expanded, offering the industry's widest range of moto and off-road products. Led by the revolutionary Formula Helmet featuring Rion technology, Fly Racing has taken big steps forward with the all-new Light Pant and Zone Pro Goggle. It's going to debut this year at the Monster Energy Supercross by Justin Brayton and the Muckoff Honda team. The Zone Pro Goggle delivers premium performance from a brand you know and trust, fearless pursuit, fly racing it's personally the gear that i wear i've worn it moto bmx mountain bike i've worn it and repped it for years in my opinion it's the best be sure to check out their goggle their helmet and all their gear fly racing Hey, big shout out to our friends at FMF. Uh, Little D and the guys are always doing some pretty exciting things, not just with the performance products, but man, they've got the coolest apparel in the game. And I want to give you guys an opportunity to get that at a little bit of a discount. If you go to FMF and, and, and pick up any gear you'd like, hats, shirts, whatever it is, upon checkout, if you enter the code MMP30, MMP30, you can get 30% off. So M. MP30 at checkout and get 30% off your order on FMF Apparel. All right, welcome back. We got Daniel Blair, uh, one of the faces of Supercross, owner of Eagle Grit, uh, co host of one of the popular podcasts on the Racer X network. Um, Daniel, one of the things that I think is cool is, I mean, you, you built your brand with, you know, main event moto. Um, you know, you, you really, come into your own and found yourself, uh, for lack of a better way of putting it with, you know, with TV and like, you just seem very comfortable on air. And now, you know, even after the race is done, you've got Blair's <clears throat> breakdown, which I think probably started as just a, a fun idea. But I look at the comments, that thing is blowing up. Um, you've really kind of kept things separate from Eagle Grit, yet Eagle Grit has still been successful. Uh, and I think that's something that you're looking to, to combine more of is letting people know, you know, the Daniel Blair brand and all that's associated with it. And Eagle Grid is part of that. Um, it, how, I mean, 
what are the one or two things that you kind of look to as far as obviously you were a you know you weren't at the top of the sport you weren't the guy winning main events but you were a well-known um racer and that obviously helps but you kept that fire alive and then stoked it and you're more popular and famous within the sport now than you were as, as a racer what are some of the things that you attribute to the growth and the building of your personal brand man i obviously doing all the things that i do gets me out there yeah. you know i'm the podcast is one avenue um race day live the you know the being on the broadcast at night Val blair's breakdown press conferences so doing all those things obviously is going to put me out there but that doesn't necessarily translate into i guess a fan base which is still so weird for me to hear like i just it's <laughs> I have people in the elevator be like, man, I'm so pumped to meet you at, you know, at the hotel. And I'm just like, so weirded out by that still. It's just, I'm maybe because I'm so based at home. I'm so like, this is like, I'm out here doing everything, but I'm not really out here trying to take it in and trying, you know, I, I guess my, my, my brand is growing, but not because I'm trying to, it's just because I'm passionate about what I do and I love what I do and I'm out there obviously. So I think for me where that this, brand has grown and where this fan base has come from is I think people can see that I'm passionate yeah, and they know it's real. It's authentic. Like I'm, you know, I'm not doing this job just for a paycheck. Obviously I have responsibilities as a father, so I have, I have to make money, but I love this stuff so much, dude. I'm when, when I go home after a race, I'm on the phone with all my friends that are all moto and we talk about it. And then I go to the track with my son and I talk it's 24 seven with me. And, and I think people see that, that I really, really, really love this and it's authentic. And people are like, you know, fans are passionate too. And I think that they had, there's, a, they see me as almost like a connection in yeah. because I am one of them at the end of the day. Like I'm a fan. Like if I'm not here, like I'm, I, if I wasn't here, I would be watching everything. Cause yeah. I just, I love this stuff. So I think that's what it is. Obviously a combination of being out there, but then also coming across you know, either an audio form or video form as someone who really, really loves it. I think that sells hard to the fans because they love it. So yeah. it is hard for me because I, I don't like to use my brand and my advantage. I've been told by so many people, like, why are you not using what you're doing with Supercross to help your business? And I just, I've always felt kind of icky about that. Like, I don't want to use this to help this. And I've been told by everyone, I'm a complete idiot about that. And I need to, I need to start taking advantage of what I've built, but I guess at the end of the day, I still don't understand what I've built. Like I don't, because I didn't try to build this, you know what I mean? Sure. I, I tried to do what I love, get paid for it. So I could take care of my kids. That was the goal. And everything else that's happening is just happening. And I'm not all the way comfortable with that yet. So yeah. obviously I'm learning and I'm learning about the world and how you have to take advantage of Russ, you know, relationships and, and, and reach, but, it's just been it's been so weird for me um, to to try to balance the two because at the end of the day, dude, I wear sweatpants at home. I freaking I sit on the couch with my kids in a cutoff t shirt. I that's who I am and what I am on screen and all this is it, it it is who I am too. But that's just like a little piece of me, right? So I'm weirded out because if people knew the real me, they'd be like, oh, this guy is like way more normal than we thought. Because I am, dude. Like my nickname at home is Captain Comfort. Like, dude, I will wear flip flops, sweatpants, a cutoff t-shirt, grow my beard out and just like live my life. And then I have this other side where I'm like this, like, you know, G level public figure. And it's still weird for me. <laughs> yeah. It's just, yeah, it's just, it's not who I really am at my core. So it's, there's a transition going on where I'm understanding it's worth, but God, I, I still, to this day, I, I don't feel comfortable with it. Yeah. It's, man, it's, it's. I'm sure, you know, somebody at your level, as far as how, how much you're out there in the public eye, it's weird because e even just from the silly little show, I mean, I'm literally just, I'm a, a regular dude from West Virginia, five miles from Racer X, I own a marketing company, I ride bicycles, I love motocross, I'm a normal guy, I'm a fan of the same guys of the sport that other fans are fans of. You know, I go to a, a GNCC race now or something, and I have four, five, six people a race, which is small, but... I, before it was nothing come up to me and want to talk to me about the podcast and to me it's weird and like it's I, weird right? I, I saw Weege at this uh past weekend's race and you know we were hanging out a little bit and I was talking to him and I was like man 
is it like do, is it weird for you still to like get approached and and do you you know do you get more of it at the GNCC versus a Supercross and it's just interesting to hear you know it's regular people like Steve Mathis is a regular dude but I, he the guy I'm yeah. sure can't even move through the concourse of a Supercross without getting you know bombarded and you're you're kind of at that level now with everything you're doing with your podcast and and on air and it, it's cool but it is. I think it's something that people forget that you're just a regular dude. Uh, and, but, and I think what's nice is you, you still think of yourself as a regular dude where it gets awkward and weird is a lot of people think that, you know, there's something special when everybody else thinks they're special and in, you're not, you're yeah. not that person. Hey, I know you're short on time. I want to get your opinion on this because you're, you know, one of the things that's cool about your podcast is you, you have some pretty hot takes. Um, and, and you also have a, some really cool opinions on just the sport I've been, you know, I, I think with the shutdown this last year, like I, I, I want anything I can get that's racing. So something I found myself looking at a lot this year is NASCAR and specifically Bubba Wallace and um, the race thing and everything that happened last year with NASCAR and him aside, I've seen how they leverage him and how he leverages himself and some of the media or some of the platforms that he's on, which helps the sport. You know, he was on a, a big uh, show that some former NFL athletes, Brandon Marshall's one of them have created called I am athlete. Um, he's been in GQ videos and, and a couple weeks ago it clicked and I'm like, man, NASCAR has that guy that is now cross-pollinating. I mean, look, somebody that looks at GQ and watches Brandon Marshall's show probably never has had any interest in NASCAR. And now there's this guy that they can connect with and resonate on. And it might be something that just gets a little bit of attention on NASCAR that they're like, hey, this is pretty cool. And it grows the following. Do you think that and everybody's had this conversation for years. What is it going to take to grow the sport? I really think our sport is missing that guy. That, And I think Ken Rocks could be that guy or Jet Lawrence could be that guy. But you don't see our stars in other platforms like GQ or on Brandon Marshall's show or something that's going to get the attention of somebody that might not have even known the sport existed like Bubba Wallace is doing in NASCAR. Do you think that that person is in our sport or that that's an area that we're missing? Or What are your thoughts on that and the growth of Supercross and Motocross? Such a good question. And I, I mean, I mean, I can't believe you asked it because it, it, there, there is an answer to it. And my opinion that I'm about to share with you comes from some of the riders. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a conversation with two riders uh, before opening ceremonies. I like to go down and just talk to the guys and what's up, you know, how was your week? Would you just kind of like, just hang with them? You know, I, I connect with these riders pretty well and I'm sitting there with two riders and um, they're like, Hey man, you're, you don't get in trouble for having your tattoo out on TV. You know, cause I got a, I got a full sleeve tattoo. Right. And I'm like, ah, oh, no, I never have. And they're like, yeah, I'm just surprised this year we're seeing it. Cause you know, you've had it for a long time. And, I personally was protective of it because I didn't I didn't know if it was okay I to remember. you know show this yeah. style of me and you know again back to the who I am like I'm a I'm a ex lead singer in a band so I have this musical side of me and I have this tattoo that was in definitely in, in that chapter of my life was definitely fitting and now it's maybe not as much but I decided to let it fly and they were they were surprised by that they were like oh you know and I was like, why, I mean, why are you surprised? They're like, I don't know. It just doesn't seem like our sport like would accept that, like, you know, you know, to the broad public. And I said, I don't know. I kind of feel like the fans of the sport probably would connect with that maybe more than, you know, than you think. And both these riders told me, you know, I think we have an image problem in our sport. And I was like, you know, and, and I, I pride myself on being pretty thoughtful on things like this. And I'm, so I'm curious. I'm like, mm, what are you saying? Like, I started digging at these two guys. And remember, these are two guys at opening ceremonies. Yeah, so this isn't so like big names. These are big names. And they said, you know, the image in our sport right now is that we are these fine tuned athletes that just, you know, just chew on nails and we're we're just these, you know, freak athletes, or you know, we're we're these crazy mm -hmm. daredevils that fly through the air. And, and both of them said this sport was at its coolest when McGrath had blue pips hair looped earrings it, like when he was a rock star yeah and they both said if this sport treated us like rock stars more this sport would grow and it would be cooler and people would actually be interested in it because they would relate to that level and it's funny they said that and i'm like i walked away going 
that might be one of the smartest things I've ever yeah. heard out of two riders who were just, they were just BSing with me. And I'm sitting here thinking, you know what? That is true. If you're a fan right now and you're not a diehard fan, you're just a fan, whatever. It takes something unique to grab your interest. Mm -hmm. And it, as sad as it seems, but this, this tour de France style athlete, this, this good way of highest it. fitness level of the entire world doesn't really relate. Mm -mm. I, I don't think people like, I mean, even Michael Phelps, like I, I love Michael Phelps, but I liked his dominance more than I liked his yeah. training re, you know, regiment. Like I, I don't really care about that. It doesn't do it for me. I don't think it does that for most people. People well, look want to see Michael a rock Phelps. star, man. You look at Michael Phelps and then you look at the track and field and you had Usain Bolt and like his swagger and ego and his poses, his attitude. His attitude yeah. His... And one, this sport, I mean, when it was, you know, when I got into it was when Pastrana was first in the X games and the, you know, the metal militia, the, 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 those bad boys. And that was when, you know, it, it really was blowing up then. And then even that, I mean, even freestyle, those guys try to come off as finely tuned athletes. And it's like, so maybe that's what it is. Um, I just find it, it interesting. It is, dude. I, there's, a, there's a disconnect, I think. Um, and it's a little bit, it's just happened naturally on accident. But I, I think this needs to go back to being a rock star. I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example of, of the athlete. Ken Roxon, right? Super yeah. good looking guy. Obviously in shape. I mean, if you've seen him with his jersey off, the dude looks like a UFC fighter. He is, he's good looking. He's got his own tattoos. He's got blonde hair that's grown out. Like, dude, Kenny he looks like a rock star and if he was treated like a rock star and portrayed like a rock star it would cross over outside of the sport and outside of racing sports too again i, I don't I, I think we need to go after the mass public in a different way with with the imaging and, and i even think about just you know you, with the magazines the um the articles the broadcast every time we see these guys we see them as these athletes and they look like mortal combat characters with their helmets on you don't see their faces like if if I'm trying to grow Ken Roxon's brand of the world, get his helmet off, exactly. get his gear off, show him the human because he's pretty damn cool. Well, and I go cool back dude. to you go back to the the interview I was talking about with Bubba Wallace. I mean, those guys not only do they have a helmet on, they're inside of a car. You don't even see their body. And I what I the most interesting part of that interview was he said something and he turned off camera and he said, "Hey, correct me if I'm wrong." And he said, "That's NASCAR over there." That's when it clicked to me. It was like, "Holy shit." NASCARs. I don't. Yeah. I'm sure his agent was involved, but NASCAR set this interview up because they understand that it's going to get him to a different audience outside. It's more of a football oriented audience. I, I just. I, I'd love to see the folks at MX Sports or the folks at Feld see the value and hey, how can we? How can we get Ken Roxon? I mean, he's his, one of his biggest sponsors is Breitling. How can we get Ken Roxon on a GQ interview or something like that? Because he is. He's appealing. It's just nobody knows who the hell he is outside of our sport. Right. So and and, and 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 to be clear, it doesn't even have to be Ken Roxon only. I mean, sure. Aaron Plessinger. Oh my God. Is, yeah. uh, is you a get him media, in a, Oh my God. He's yeah. a media gold mine, mm -hmm. and it's because he's authentic. 100%. He is a self-proclaimed goofy hillbilly. Just black. He is so freaking cool, and he relates to people. People would see him and be like. Damn, that dude's cool. Why do you think Stank Dog is so loved? It's because Stank Dog is real. Yeah, and I, and I think the problem is in the sport is again, it's it's it, to me, it's gotten to be very glam with the videography and the photography with these guys in slow motion poetry as athletes. And I don't think anyone gives a crap about that other than the diehard fan. The new fan doesn't care about that. The new fan wants to know what does he look like, right? What does he sound like? What's his background and is he cool? Yeah, no and that's doubt. why for me, opening ceremonies even, they should not be on the bike. No. You're going to see three hours of bikes. Come out, opening ceremonies. I want to see Ken Roxton and Eli Tomac and Cooper Webb's big old face on AT&T Stadium's um, giant screen and show these people who our athletes are. And um, I just, I, I think we really need to focus on the individual, not the individual racer. Yeah. Because they, of course they race and that's what's cool about them to us. And the fans that already love this sport and the fans that already spend money in this sport. But the new people out there that don't really know what Supercross is or don't understand it, they're going to grab hold of the individual person yep. more than the individual as a racer. So I, for me, that's that's where I think we need to go. All the focus needs to be how do we get these humans in front of humans and, and portray them as the badasses that they are. The, the, 
Supercross racers are they're sick, man. They're they're yes, they're fine tuned athletes. Yes, they're but but more than that, they're pretty damn cool. I mean, I, here's the proof in the pudding. Go look at the wives and the girlfriends in this sport, man. <laughs> Moto dudes pull yeah, they rippers. Pull chicks. Yep. And yeah. it's for a reason. It's not because they look good in their gear and their helmet. It's because they're cool. Yeah. And um, I, I don't. It, that's my opinion. Maybe people are like, no, they're not cool. They're lame. I know these guys well enough to know that we got some freaking cool ones that need to be pushed out there as being cool. Yeah. And that will bring the eyes in, and then they'll start understanding the sport that they do. But I don't. I don't think them on their motorcycles is going to bring in the new viewer. I think them as people will, and, yeah. I, and that's where I think the push needs to be. Man, again, I love your your takes on this kind of stuff and, and uh, respect what you're doing and I'm looking forward to, we're getting ready to do some cool stuff together, so I'm looking forward to being able to work with you more. Oh, yeah. and, and man, I, I, I told you a few weeks ago in a text, I absolutely love what you're doing on on air and then man the, the Blair's breakdown stuff it's just it you you're 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 in you're in your groove right now man and it's it's it really is fun to watch and uh I'm excited for you and I know you got to run I appreciate you coming on the show and looking forward to uh talking to you again here soon and hopefully having you in studio one of these days if we're ever allowed to come you know within six feet of each other we'll have you in the studio I love that, man. I, I do want to throw out one final message to anyone listening because this is very important to me because it it had a huge effect on my life just with the, the books that I've read and the people that I listen to that are motivating to me. If you are if you are seeing my success right now kind of blossoming, it's because of suffering. And you have to embrace the suffer. You have to love the suffer. Trust me, I, I come across pretty happy. I'm suffering many days uh, of the week but it's a good suffer because it's like, it's all in. And when you go all in on something, it's not easy. It's not all fun. It's you, you have rough nights, you have rough days, you have days where you want to quit, but God, if you just put your head down, you go all in and you embrace the suffer. It might take a year, it might take five years, man. I, I'm 38 years old and it's finally taking, but go all in suffer and you will get everything you want and maybe even a little more and um i just i want that message out there because that message worked for me you know i i i've <laughs> i've heard it on multiple podcasts these psychological guys these motivators whatever and a lot of it's just a lot of blah, blah, you know what? but there's there's something to what i just said I, i'm i'm telling you if you commit you can accomplish anything you have to be willing to hurt a little I mean, Cooper Webb didn't win his championship. It wasn't all, uh, you know, it wasn't all roses. Eli Tomac went through five years of just emotional wreckage to get that Supercross title. And I guarantee you ask him right now, was it worth the suffer? Was it, was it worth the pain? Dude. hundred percent. Yeah. You know, you know it is. So yeah, 100%. anyone listening like right now, if, if you're motivated in life, just know that if you want what you want, you're going to suffer. And if you suffer with a smile, you, you, you can, who I mean, who knows? You you can do anything. So Absolutely. that's just final thing I wanted to say. No, I appreciate it, man. And it's it's hundred percent true. Um so Man, I appreciate you coming on, Daniel. Good luck tonight, and uh, I think we're gonna have this episode go out this week. So if you're watching it, it's uh, it's a current one. We normally can these things and push them out a couple weeks late, but um, you're going into Arlington two tonight, so you guys should see this before Arlington three. So I appreciate you coming on. Right on, man. All Thank right, brother. You. Talk talk soon. Thank you for listening to the Moto Marketing Podcast. If your goal is to get real, measurable results from your marketing that will grow your company revenue, then check out how Impact Media can get the same results that they have for Moto's most iconic brands by visiting thinkimpact.com. That's T H I N K I M P A K T.com. Have a marketing question that you want answered on the show? Send your questions to questions at motomarketingpodcast.com. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. And we'll catch you on the next episode of the Moto Marketing Podcast.